So how's it going, everyone? My name is Money and Me podcast. In this podcast, we get to see some of the most enticing interviews ranging from metaverse, blockchain, and what not in Web3. And today also I have a very interesting guest by my side. He is the co-founder and CEO at Bash.gg. His name is Kyle Sapitel. A- am I pronouncing your name right? Yep, yep, you got it. Thanks, Harsh. Uh, yeah. So first of all, tell us, how are you doing and how is the summer there at your place? <laughs> it's, it's great. Uh, I live in New York, and so it's been oscillating between extremely hot and uh, beautiful, um, which is better than it always being extremely hot. So pretty happy. <laughs> For me, it's kind of like too damn hot, even though the temperature is not that high, but still the sun here is something different, like. I am feeling the heat on my skin more than I felt back in India. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of oh, wow. difficult for me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to dive into the conversation, I will start off uh, with most basic question. How did you come in the world of Web3? And what is that that excites you most about the world of Web3? Yeah, um, I was, uh, I got into the world of Web3 when it was just Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, this must've been 2014 around, uh, or earlier. Um, I just was interested honestly in online gambling, which is kind of a fun way to, to get involved. So I, I was just kind of researching ways in which like you can move money around. And I came across this interesting thing, Bitcoin, and, uh, it was like this cool permissionless way to transfer value around. Um, and I, I thought it was really cool. So I wrote a little paper on it and, uh, for one of my math classes and was pretty interested in it, but more intellectually interested than, you know, trying to start my own company. Um, I think it wasn't until like Ethereum came around and this idea of decentralized computing um, came into my mind that I was like, wow, so this might be uh, something that, you know, has potential. I was a little skeptical of just moving value around and like, you know, governments ever supporting something like that. Uh, but yeah, when, once the idea of decentralized computing came about, I figured that's kind of a powerful concept. Uh, being able to run arbitrary code in this like, in this manner that's completely permissionless um, just by spending a few uh, ETH. And um, so that's when I got really excited about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as you said, uh, you were skeptical at the start of it. Me too. Like, I'm still skeptical about the crypto space as, as it's suddenly rolling down, like, exponentially. I cannot just believe that. Just back in the day in 2022, in the end of 2022, we were, like, on the highest apex that we are, that we have ever seen in Bitcoin. And now we are just, I don't know where. So, <laughs> so Yeah. As you said, uh, and I'm still skeptical about the world of crypto. Now, I would like to yeah. know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that's that's pretty reasonable to me. Like, uh, I I think a lot of people who are really into the space, and and I'm into it. Like, trust me, I think it's really cool. Uh, I think we forget that like a lot of this is based off of what people are willing to accept. The reason that the U.S. dollar works is because people are willing to take that as payment. Um, because they have faith that, you know, the government is back in and, and, you know, so it should work. The reason Bitcoin has any value is because people have faith that, like, it will continue to gain in value. It will continue to be useful as this value transfer. It really comes back to just, like, large groups of people having faith in the system. And why, you know, why couldn't that faith disappear at any moment? Who knows? Uh, not to, like, bring fear into the the whole mix of things, but... It, it's true. And the same with, you know, faith can dissipate uh, in terms of faith in your government as well. So since it's all based off of this kind of collective agreement of uh, value, um, I think that is like intrinsically kind of this slightly scary and, and unsettling thing. Yeah, yeah. And as you said, like cryptocurrencies are seen more as a form of investment uh, than as a form of currency. And it's kind of ironic according to their name. And also, it's kind of uh, weird that uh, money is just a sort of illusion that me and you agree upon that this piece of paper holds this certain value. And the moment that you realize it, 
the world inside your brain collapses because we are just, um, we, our societies are just based, up, based upon this little belief that money is money. This piece of paper means something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. Now, I would like to move on to bash.gg. I would like to know from you, what is it and how did you came up with it? Yeah. Uh, so bash.gg is a store for browser games. And what we enable is for you to actually own your games, just like you used to when you bought a disc from, you know, GameStop, you could then go give that, that disc to a friend or sell it back to GameStop. Um, with bash.gg, the games that you buy uh, are actually, the ownership of it is recorded on the Solana blockchain. And so then I can then send you my video game or send, you know, a friend or resell it on the open market once I'm done playing with it. So it's bringing ownership, uh, which like we at bash.gg think that that is how things should be, that when you buy something, when you pay 20, 50, $100 for a video game, that you actually own what you're buying versus you just get the right to play it for that fee. Uh, which is the paradigm that most people live in using Steam and Xbox and PlayStation. So we want to shift that paradigm to ownership. And we think the blockchain is what enables that. So you are using a private blockchain or like a public blockchain for that? We're using a, the Solana blockchain. So I think it's really important. This goes back to fundamental belief, right? Mm -hmm. To use a blockchain that a lot of people have accepted as useful and that there's more than just like Bash on that blockchain. There's got to be lots of applications, lots of interoperability uh, potential. And so if that doesn't exist, and, and there's some competitors out there uh, who have built their own blockchain to kind of do what we're doing, and only they use it. Uh, we don't think that's actually useful. We think one of the key parts that makes blockchain useful is this interoperability with like a thriving ecosystem. Without that ecosystem, the blockchain might have as well as the AWS servers that you run. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just out of context, um, uh, do you find proof of stake better than proof of work or proof of work better than proof of stake? Yeah, I, so yeah, there's drawbacks to both, right? It's the, the biggest drawback that I think people say about proof of work is just like the environmental impact, the idea that like it uses a lot of energy one of the common counter arguments, which I think is really fair, is like, sure, it uses a lot of energy, but that's not the problem. We should be using sustainable uh, energy sources. And then there, it's not a big deal if everything's coming from solar. Um, but I, I also think that um, proof of work uh, is cost prohibitive uh, for the common person to get involved with. Now, the same could be said for proof of stake because you need a certain amount of stake to get involved. Um, but that can be that barrier to entry um, is a capital barrier to entry, a singular, a singular capital barrier to entry. Whereas if you try to spin up a Bitcoin mining rig right now, um, it's really difficult to participate in any way that's cost effective uh, because your, your rig is going to cost you, you know, thousands of dollars. Um, and then uh, on top of that, you have to actually have the technical ability to set up a good, a good rig. Um, and then, you know, you have your energy costs. And so you end up losing money. Um, whereas on the Solana blockchain, uh, everyday people like you and I can actually participate in staking our Solana uh, and securing the network. And we can make active decisions that, that promote decentralization. We can actually stake with a smaller validator node uh, that doesn't have a lot of stake. And we can help promote, you know, their ability to, to come onto the market. So you know, I have a $10,000 computer, which is what it costs to, to basically create a validator node. And then I can get on the market and then I can say, hey, you know, everybody in this call and all my teammates, like, let's all throw a few Solana in there. I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars, but like, we can do this together and we can create an effective validator node. So I think that part is really cool about proof of stake. And that's what I really like about it. Um, and then obviously there's some benefits with like, it's, it's, um, it's very energy efficient compared to proof of stake or uh, proof of work. So I, I ultimately lean towards proof of stake. Mm -hmm. Both of them have their advantages and I love to see innovation in this field. And talking about gaming and bash.gg, um, how do you think like firms and companies like 
um, Bash.gg are going to get involved in the world of metaverse? Like, um, are you going to give people access to these 3D objects that are available in the metaverse or something else? So we're focused on owning the game in and of itself. So uh, we haven't really ventured into like objects, you know, owning in-game objects. I think uh, I have kind of a, con I'd say like a contrary opinion to most people in this, in who are in my field. Um, I think it would be really difficult to imagine a world where every individual game developer uh, wants to have their resources shared cross game because those resources were purchased on that game. And that's like a source of revenue for that game, right? So it doesn't really make sense that, hey, you know, I'm buying resources on Fortnite and then I'm gonna go use those on Call of Duty because then Call of Duty isn't making any money from, from their in-game purchases. Why even have in-game items, you know, is their perspective at that point, right? So the interoperability of, of game items is difficult to imagine when it comes to cross cross like publisher or cross developer now obviously like you know if you have the first call of duty and then you can transfer your items to the second call of duty like maybe that's kind of interesting to a game publisher but i think generally it's kind of hard to imagine a world where like all of these items are interoperable um because it, it's uh you know from an economic standpoint games are dissuaded from doing that because it ruins their revenue model Mm -hmm. Hundred percent agree. Like it's a really great point. Um, when it comes to commercialization or commerce, um, it gets difficult to operate with one another because if one is making money, the other has to lose money in some way or other. Yeah. So yeah, completely right. agree with that. And coming into metaverses, like, um, what is the real utility of metaverse? as we cannot interact really physically with this metaverse, the objects and, and all of them. So where does the real utility of this metaverse lie? So um, again, for somebody who's in gaming, in Web3 and blockchain, I think there's a lot of uh, fluff around metaverse. Um, so I, you know, before we move to building Bash, one of the key things that I wanted to get into my team of is that the metaverse is actually just video games. This is why it makes sense to be a video game store. Uh, in reality, like everyone's using the term metaverse, but we've been playing in metaverses, you know, for since we've been playing video games or interacting with social networks. Um, so, uh, it, you know, in my view, like there's not like, it's not like a zero to one sort of thing with the metaverse. I think what is really happening is more and more people have free time, leisure time, as the as you know, society itself uh, moves to jobs that are uh, more white collar type of work, and so they have more free time, and they spend that free time playing. Play is like the core of what gaming is, and when they play, they want to play in these like fictitious worlds where they get to do what they want, um, and they get to have some story and things like that, right? It's interactive uh, storytelling, it's interactive experiences. So um, people wanna play, more people will play over time. I have this thesis that AI will take more and more blue collar work. If you look at like trucking, for example, right? Uh, trucking's gonna be completely taken over by AI within a few years. And I don't think people understand the impact of that. That's gonna be absolutely massive. Now, the reality of, is like, there will be other issues that come out of that. You have a lot of workers out of work. You know, we might want to think about things like uh, universal basic income, whatever needs to be done to support these people who are not going to have jobs. But the long story short is whether they get upskilled and they start some white collar career or whether, you know, whether the government has to help support them through this transition, whatever the solution, they will have more free time. They will have more time where they're going to play more as a, as a source of entertainment because this is something humans naturally like to do. And given that, uh, I think like as our economy continues towards this direction of us doing less time consuming labor, we will continue to play more. We will continue to get involved in these, uh, in these digital worlds more. And thus, since our time is spent in digital worlds, the value of things in digital worlds increases. 
So, you know, I'll care a lot more what my Fortnite skin is if I play Fortnite every single day versus if I play Fortnite once a month, right? The value increases as I use it more, as it, as it you know, shows who I am more to my friends. Um, and so I think those are the trends that I'm seeing. But I don't think like metaverse in and of itself, um, I think we're far away from it. Like I've used virtual reality since it was like very nascent. Um, and I've watched this evolution that's been absolutely incredible, like faster than I could have expected in part because of Meta's R&D um, and how much money they dumped into that. Uh, but that being said, I think like the idea that we're gonna like live in these virtual worlds, I think that will take a lot of time. And I think for the fidelity that you'd need to live in a virtual world to be like, to not really, uh, I guess like to spend a lot of time there, I think the fidelity has to be so high that we actually have to like integrate something into our brains in order to get to that point versus mm -hmm. like keeping these VR headsets on. Like, I don't think these, this offers us the experience that we'd expect when we honestly think metaverse area that I spend a bunch of time into. Like your eyes get tired staring at the mm -hmm. screen that close. That's always gonna be the reality of it. Uh, people get dizzy, people have different reactions to it. We need to meld digital with physical. The only way to do that, I personally think is a direct uh, connection to your brain. Yeah, totally, uh, as you said. Um, with current technology, metaverse seems a distant story. And with things like VR, current VRs, it is very hard to imagine metaverse as we imagine it right now, that we can interact with objects. And even the interaction with objects is quite not clear because the re even the re researches over these topics, like if you can feel an object um, in metaverse is quite skeptical about this because yeah, we do not have required technology. And then comes the environment. You need to smell. You need to have smell of that environment. Then you can understand, yeah, I'm really there. So there are a lot of technical hurdles, as you said. And from my point of view, it would take tens of years, if not, if not 50. It would take tens of years to be like fully functional and fully developed and fully ready to be like adopted by masses. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it'll take some time. Even with VR, we're seeing that, like, um, I think, you know, for example, Zuck thought that it would be faster, the adoption curve. Like, things like COVID accelerated the adoption curve of Oculus. But I, again, somebody as deep in the industry as I am, somebody who likes to game and plays video games often, you know, you'd think I'd be the prime user of something like Oculus. Yet I find myself spending very minimal time uh, in the Oculus. And so there's a lot of like user experience uh, issues um, and also just the barrier to entry, right? Just like picking up the headset, putting it on. And, and it sounds so simple, but humans are really fucking lazy. All right. Like we don't want to do stuff. So sitting on the couch and like clicking a button and playing the video game like this that's a little bit easier than throwing this thing on my head, having to stand up and move around. And, and again, it sounds so simple yet. I think like when I think about user experience and I think about like product development, these are things that I think about, right? I think about what is the fastest, uh, the fat, the shortest path from point A to point B and how do I make sure users get there really quickly? How do we lower those barriers? So things like that have to be overcome. And I, you know, frankly, like I don't have the answers right now, um, but I think like it will take more time uh, and I think that we have a long way to go. Yeah. And as you said, like uh, humans are lazy to do that. I completely agree to that too, because um, even when I used VR, I used it once or twice. And then I was like, Counter Strike is better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I yeah. just got back to it. <laughs> and yeah. since then, I never really used VR again. And uh, I'm playing Counter Strike till day, so there is a kind of difference. The 2D metaverse, I would say, it's 2D metaverse because it's just a screen, is much better than 3D metaverse right now. But it's just a question of time and technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now talking about metaverse, we all know about Meta. Facebook um, made Meta its parent company. And as we know, Meta is just an acronym for Metaverse. So what are your views upon Meta about what they're doing? 
Yeah, I, I think like people will be surprised like uh, how much market share Meta captures just just because um, one they you know they're on top of it. Like frankly, like they've they've put a lot of investment in this. They have some great engineers and people working there. Uh, they've built something that's like really simple and really cool. Their main metaverse is Horizon. Um, I like. I personally think like it's really attractive uh, the way they built it in that the the barrier to entry is really low in terms of um, like logging in and things like that. So a lot of the competition metaverse uh, that we hear about in Web3 is, is this like, you got to sign up for a wallet, you have to have cryptocurrency, you got to get involved in blockchain, right? Like that, those are big barrier to entries. Like that's a lot of work to like do those things. Whereas, you know, Facebook's metaverse, uh, you sign up with Facebook and everybody has Facebook and, and then you throw on your headset or, you know, I don't know if there's a way to get involved on the web yet, but like, you know, it, basically uh, getting involved is a lot easier. So if there was a metaverse to take off right now, I think it would make a lot of sense that it would be something like Facebook's horizon over, you know, anything that's being developed in like the blockchain space at the moment. I have not, I've yet to see like a really compelling vision uh, developed in the blockchain space. And trust me, like I want them to win, right? I, like I like the idea that like, you know, uh, things are decentralized, people have more ownership, there are lower fees, higher market competition. But the reality is that's just not going to happen in, until there's a compelling, easy to use, uh, immersive virtual world uh, that is blockchain based, which is going to take a lot of time. Mm, of course. And Facebook, a giant like Facebook is in metaverse. And of course, it will capture a large gap of market. And also, mm -hmm. Facebook is interested in researching about AI since long. And if you combine, like you said, if, you, if we combine these two things, metaverse and AI, this could be a really disruptive combination because AI, as I said, mm -hmm. is going to take so many jobs and um, people who are going to seek metaverse to meet new people while staying at their place, while um, being anonymous, it could be a real, you know, kind of um, real something that's not true. Because if you immerse AI in metaverse, then you could be talking to a bot and still be feeling like you're talking to a yeah, human. Right, right. Yeah. So I want to know your views. So, it. yeah, it's interesting because like metaverse and like uh, virtual reality and these these technologies, I think, have developed slower. Uh, at least VR uh, has developed slower, and the adoption curve has been slower than I have predicted. That I think a lot of people predicted. On the other hand, I think AI has developed and uh, grown and become more complex at a way more accelerated rate than I ever would have thought. I mean, I think things like uh, what OpenAI is doing are absolutely incredible. With their recent release of DALI, um, it, something that, that needs to be pointed out, I was reading a really interesting point that uh, to develop a photo is not just like these, you know, you, you have the AI develop these array of pixels. There's actually something much more complicated going on there where you have to have context about the space. You have to have context about like, you have to have spatial awareness. You have to understand like objects in a scene to like compose a photo at a point where it's like that, that realistic. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And theoretically, like the same ideas uh, of this like AI generated photo could be applied uh, to like 3D generated worlds and who knows, like maybe that's how we create an infinite metaverse, probably. Um, but I think like the technology in AI is accelerated at such an incredible pace uh, that like, I would be very surprised, like um, generalized like artificial intelligence will probably come along a lot faster than we, than we think, which is a little bit scary, um, but also very cool, uh, but also very scary. Um, but I, I think like the combination of AI and metaverse is, is a very natural fit. I think like exactly what you're talking about, like beyond the, the idea of like people losing jobs, like uh, AI, uh, AI is digitally native, like metaverse is this digitally native universe. AI in uh, the metaverse is just like having humans in the metaverse. It's like, especially if they're like generally intelligent, um, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference theoretically between like a human and an AI. 
uh, for all you know, it you know could be either, especially when everything is exactly like you're saying, like kind of pseudo anonymous. Um, so yeah, it, it's like scary, dangerous, really cool, all at the same time, as is usually with these frontier technologies. Mm-hmm. And as in, like speaking about Delhi, uh, I, I I just use Delhi too, and the power awesome. that that product has is immense. Like you are just inputting the sentence and you are getting some variations of images. And it's kind of astounding that AI understand what I am saying. Like it has never happened before. Like even the language translation is not that good that DALI 2 can produce. Oh my God. Like um, I just, for It's example, crazy. Yeah, yeah, completely. And the quality of photos are just, oh my God. You cannot even think like AI can do it this fast in just, we are in just 2022 and it is that fast. Yeah. So the first thought that came to my mind after watching that was like graphic designers, thumbnail designers, or any sort of graphic related work yeah. is kind of gone. That was, that's the other thing. Like, I feel like a prediction in 2015 was, oh, well, sure, AI will do things like driving cars, but they couldn't replace creative work, right? Or could they, right? Like with, with OpenAI's GPT-3, with Dolly 2, I mean, there's no reason why not all social media managers aren't replaced by AI uh, in a few years. And, you know, that that's also kind of scary, right? That content can be completely generated um, by these programs. Like before we know it, like we'll have full Facebook, feeds and threads that are like 90% AI generated AI talking to each other. Like, it's just like the internet will be crazy. We'll have no idea how to actually identify who is human, who is not. And, and I smile about this, but also in the back of my head, that's kind of scary. And I know with how slow governments move, there's zero chance they're going to be on top of this before it's a thing. I mean, we're kind of lucky. I hate to say like, ooh, our Lord and Savior, like companies, private companies, but we're kind of lucky that like OpenAI has taken this approach where they've been relatively restrictive about uh, use cases. If they notice that you're misusing this platform, they'll ban you. Like AI, OpenAI has another route. That's grab as much cash as you can. As long as somebody's paying for it, who cares? And people will pay a lot of money for, for AI that's that good, right? Um, but they don't do that, right? They take the careful, uh, studied approach. And I think that's really important. And they also try to like be acknowledge, you know, what might happen to society if they take the wrong route. Um, and yeah, that's something that I've respected a lot, but frankly, like this is not something that should be up to the hand, you know, up, up to the, a few people who are running these companies, because if, if we don't get lucky, they could take this the wrong way. They could use it the wrong way. Um, this is why we need like government regulation on how AI is used and what we use it for and probably labeling AI everywhere on the internet just so we, we know. Um, and yeah, that stuff's not going to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. well, what OpenAI is doing is essential. And I think that that kind of jobs would be the only jobs that would be not um, engulfed by AI because someone needs to control that AI too. So I think that's the only job that yeah. might be safe from AI because um, yeah, right, right. Open AI the is also producing these code, code completions, you know? Yeah. yeah, right, exactly. Programmers are gone too, right? Yeah. <laughs> you just type in, I want, I, want a, I want Zoom and then it'll code up Zoom for you, yeah. So it's interesting uh, uh, as well as surprising as well as depressing at the same time, yeah? Yep, yep. yep. Coming back to cryptocurrencies, like uh, as we have talked about it before, that crypto industry has just crumbled down. What are your views on, on it? What caused it and what we can see in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think like what we have going on is like uh, a, mac a lot of macro trends that like caused uh, not only crypto to boom, but um, caused stocks to boom, right? Um, like in the US, we all got X amount of dollars or whatever. It's actually trillions of dollars, I guess, uh, if you add it up. So a bunch of money was injected into the economy, not just given to people, but a lot of like just buying of equities. Like I think just like everything was just like absolutely, um, uh, absolutely kind of like 
I'd, I guess like sugar coated and money. Um, and so everything just went boom. And I think like it was a, it was just kind of like in due time, the market will correct itself and go back to the mean. Um, the bad part about it going back to the mean right now is that while at the same time we have a recession basically starting, um, we also have uh, in high inflation. And so that's really hard to combat and work with both of those um, because, oh, well, now we're going to have to make the recession worse, raising interest rates. Um, but then, you know, that's the only way to get inflation under control. Um, so it, it's all kind of uh, messed up, right? Like, I wouldn't even say it's just crypto, right? It's just like a, a lot of how uh, the pandemic scary, the, the scary pandemic impact on the economy a lot of our reaction to that and trying to prevent crash there, we're now going to pay for it now. Um, now there's other like macro trends that people much smarter than me follow. Uh, I'm more focused on video games, but um, I, I think like ultimately like this was just like bound to happen and it doesn't say anything about the technology. I think the one thing it did show and uh, which is a lot of crazy things happening in crypto is like it did rip open the holes of the things that were actually not so great happening in crypto so like luna terra right like it ripped open a hole and it showed you know uh the problems with that system and the way it works and that you know 20 percent yield uh, i guess is unsustainable um it it ripped open holes in uh in a lot of like how some of these funds were or run some of these crypto funds are blowing up right now um, a lot of people were over leveraged uh, and yeah, it, we saw the whole thing, just a lot of things blow up. That being said, crypto still there, right? Like um, a lot of protocols worked really well, actually, despite these crazy fluctuations, this huge movement of capital out of um, DeFi, out of like these yield farms and things like that, like massive movements of capital. And yet DeFi still, a lot of these protocols are still working fine. Um, and things are still functioning well. So it was a stress test, right? Um, and some things didn't work out. Some things uh, are still there. And I think long-term and what has always happened in crypto is these stress tests make crypto stronger, make the protocols, the L1s uh, stronger. And then we'll see you know, another boom at some point and I'm sure another bust. And that's how it'll keep going for a period of time until it stabilizes. Uh, and it becomes some sort of mainstream thing. But I think like one thing we did realize is we need more utility uh, on top of these uh, chains. Uh, we need more than just like you trade token A for token B for token C and you get some sort of yield for allowing the swap of token A to token B, but token A and token B don't mean anything because they're part of these weird like Ponzi scheme protocols. Like we need more, right? We need We need more utility. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like, as you said, um, crypto, crypto is like time to see the mirror. And as you said, crypto is just a more volatile form of market. And we haven't understand these stock markets yet. And we are just in the start of understanding these crypto, uh, like cryptocurrencies, how they work in these um, markets, how they work in the trading and long-term investing. And as you said, it's uprolling itself and it's unrolling itself and we are knowing more about it. And it is showing us that these are the places, these are the loopholes that needs to be filled, that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to move on to, like, we have talked about cryptocurrencies. Now, what are the future of them? Now, I'd like to know the bigger, uh, like your views on the bigger picture of it. Like, what are your views on Web3? Like, it's yeah, future. I yeah, totally. I think like, um, I, I think it's a good way to measure, uh, it's a good way to record ownership of things that are like agnostic of some platform or, uh, you know, some company. Like an example of that is why I think bash.gg is really cool is because games are not like, they're not, platform necessarily they're not platform bound um, they don't have to be is where they're trending like obviously games are there's pc games and there's playstation games and uh, xbox games but they don't necessarily have to be platform bound 
especially when they're streamed or they're running on the browser because browser is accessible from everywhere. You know, you can access some stream from anywhere. So you have this thing that like can be platform agnostic. You have this thing that like uh, it has some sort of intrinsic value, which is like uh, the value of, of uh, joy, I guess like play, like how much you'd play something is kind of how you might measure the value of a game. So it has like X hours of entertainment wrapped into it. Um, and people should own these digital things. And like, I think that's what the blockchain is good at, right? Like you have this digitally native asset and like you can own it now because there's this record that nobody can change and everybody can trust. Um, I think that's where, where it can be really powerful. Now, what are the other use cases of that? Like maybe like tokenizing real world assets and being able to transfer them at a very low cost to something. So I, I always go back to like uh, uh, futures or like um, like trading oil, right? Like they don't actually, uh, when professional traders trade oil, they aren't actually like shipping the oil from point A to point B most of the time. They're just like trading um, the oil uh, at, you know, paper value or the value of the oil um, and they're moving around. Now, something that's really interesting uh, that was brought up to me at, at the Solana conference actually is how a lot of people don't know how that actually happens. Like when you trade oil, let's say someone in, in Germany trades oil with someone in America, um, usually like uh, these transactions go through multiple banks and they're manually updated. Um, they're manually reconciled at, at like the end of the day or something. There's somebody who goes in there and billions of dollars is spent on this reconciling uh, asset movement and fund movement. And so this, this reconciliation part could be completely um, automated using the blockchain. So that's where like, I think things get really cool. It's like uh, moving the world's financial system um, into an area where you don't need these manual reconciliation because it's this decentralized trustless ledger that automatically enters your, your transactions. And it happens with Solana, right? Within seconds, uh, there's an updated entry. So that's, that's pretty cool. And, and like the impact of that is pretty large. Um, now, like in terms of other use cases, you know, I think those will develop over time. I'm not sure. Sometimes I think it's a natural thing where uh, people like myself who get excited about a new technology want to, they see every place to apply it to, right? I can apply blockchain to everything. Really cool. It's going to change the world. But like very practically, we have to go back to those uh, fundamentals of like, is applying blockchain in this case actually making it 10x better? In the case of like the world financial system and how things are transacted, it does make things 10x better if we can ever get there. That's a really long road and there's a lot of mm -hmm. problems with that. And, you know, what blockchain do we use and how do we represent it? How do we make sure it's efficient and doesn't end up costing more? Um, there's a lot of questions there. But I think like financial systems, it's really cool. I think people owning, actually owning the things that uh, in the digital world is really cool. Um, what else? I, I don't know. Like uh, I've seen a lot of interesting things that I haven't thought super critically about, about whether they actually add that 10 X value or not. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. And have you ever heard about web five? Like uh, the founder of Twitter, <laughs> yeah. he, he was saying <laughs> yeah. that we Dorsey's need to combine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he's the one <laughs> who is banning people on Twitter. And he's talking about <laughs> decentralizations. That's kind of funny for me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think the whole uh, Doris is a really funny guy. Like, obviously, he's done some like incredible things, right? Like he started Twitter. And like, okay, maybe maybe a guy gets lucky, right? Like, why is this social media? Why do any social media sites become big? Maybe the guy got lucky. No, he starts like block, right? And he starts like more billion dollar companies. He's obviously like, fucking really smart and like, like uh, really good at what he does. Um, you know, so like probably one of the best entrepreneurs in the world, but like why he's shilling Bitcoin as like the solution to everything. And then it's the only good cryptocurrency and like all of this when like there are very clear problems uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know, but like, and, and then he's rebranding Web3 into Web5 uh, 
but Web5 does exactly what everyone's trying to get Web3 to do. I think we should try to fix Web3 first before we move on to Web5. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like math, I mean, dude's obviously a genius. So maybe I'm missing something that, uh, you know, he understands that I don't, but um, I, I don't understand all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Time's going to tell if he's right or not. I wish he is, but I think that's what Web3, but improvised. I would say that. <laughs> um, now I'd like to know from you, like, um, why do people tend to buy NFTs or digital art um, when we have physical assets that could be more valuable to us? We can see them, we can feel them. Um, and NF like these digital assets are easily reproducible, even though not in blockchain, but you can make a copy of it, which is yeah. not blockchain based. Yeah, you're understanding what I'm saying. Yep, totally. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it goes back to like money, right? Like um, this, art is another one of those things where the value is dictated by the amount of people that believe in the value. So like if I'm the only one who cares about your art, but I think it's really great, I probably have some price that I'm willing to pay for it uh, to buy your art, physical or digital. Um, the Mona Lisa, though, uh, is world renowned. Everybody knows it, right? Um, and so now it's worth a lot of money. Everybody, you know, if they could say, you know, I own the Mona Lisa, there's a lot of social status because everybody knows the Mona Lisa. So it's like, uh, and, and I think the similar thing goes to brands. Uh, and a lot of people prop like these 10K projects up to being like, they're just brands, right? Board Ape Yacht Club is valuable because it's a brand now uh, that people recognize. Uh, and there is a lot of value in that, right? Like something that uh, I've been noticing a trend of you have GameStop and Radio Shack, right? These brands that like we all know uh, and maybe like we have some childhood interest in, right? Like the, it, it reminds, it's some nostalgic interest in. So these brands are using the fact that they are strong brands and people think they're relevant uh, to, to boost up whatever product they're now selling. So that type of power is actually really big, right? And, and it's something that's like really hard to develop it's one of those intangibles. It's really hard to measure, right? You can measure maybe the number of followers on Twitter or something like that, or maybe there's some score we can come up for brand recognition. Um, but it, it's actually insane that you can be Radio Shack, which has no market value anymore. And nobody's buying stuff from Radio Shack. And you can just, you can create a, D, a DeFi protocol and then everybody's gonna pay attention because you're Radio Shack, right? That's the power of the brand. You can launch any product and you have instant distribution. There's people who are going to pay attention. Um, so with art, you know, whether it's like individual one-of-one -one art, you know, a Beeple piece may be really cool to own right now, um, or whether it's like a 10K project where there's a lot of owners, um, a lot of it is just like dictated by the amount that you're willing to pay for it. Um, and that is, that is like, a combination of factors about like, you know, does this increase my social status? Um, you know, is this something that I actually think is beautiful? I think somewhat matters. Uh, and then also does this, you know, with the Board Ape Yacht Club, you're also kind of buying access, but like, you know, maybe increase in social status or association with this brand gives you access to things or perceived access or whatever it might be. So I think a lot of it is, is intangible. A lot of it is just like belief and that goes back to like, you know, how we measure uh, value and money. Um, but I, I, you know, yeah, I, I think like ever since the dollar, <laughs> the gold standard, like it's been kind of a belief-based system. Uh, and I think, I guess like art has always been a belief-based system. How much are you willing to pay for that piece that you really like? Yeah, yeah. And uh, what I understand from what you just said is a part of art is appreciation and the other part is status based. People play status games in order to be um, seemingly up that ladder by buying a piece yep. that is um, seemingly more expensive as, and that implies that is directly proportional to the status that they achieve in the society. See, I have this painting. It is, a, it is painted by so-and-so yeah. and it, is, it costs so-and-so. So yeah, NFT survives over that, I guess, like many creators like Logan Paul are selling their NFTs and people are buying it as like, I have a, this Logan Paul NFT. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, people know who Logan Paul is. So 
adds value to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before ending this podcast, I would like to know from you um, any ending views that you might want the viewers of this podcast to take with them home. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things I talked about at NFT NYC, I, I give a small talk and it was centered around, well, the title was meant to be a little controversial and it was people don't want your gaming NFTs uh, was, was the title of my talk. And so my main point in that talk was how NFTs by the public, I think, you know, I, I don't know what percentage of people, I'm not going to venture to say that, but I think there's a lot of people who don't like NFTs, vehemently hate NFTs. Um, and if you haven't interacted with someone like that, uh, you're lucky and you like NFTs and you're like an NFT enthusiast. If somebody hasn't said, screw you, you like NFTs, NFTs are horrible, then you, you've avoided uh, a lot of people somehow. Um, or you don't get out much, whatever it might be. The, mm -hmm. the point being that there's this irrational hate of NFTs right now. So if you or your friend or whoever irrationally hates NFTs, please convince them that it's just a technology and it doesn't have to be this JPEG, right? It doesn't have to be this picture. It is just a way to represent ownership in a digital world. And like, yeah, that JPEG might not be your style. You might not care for art. You might not care to have the unique thing. Maybe someone else does, uh, but digital ownership can be important when we talk about like your data, right? Like what about digital ownership of the things that Facebook actually makes a profit of? I'm sure there's some way we could measure the value of your data based off of Facebook's income uh, in how they use that in advertising, right? So I'm sure we could value that in some way. And there, that maybe that's a more tangible way to talk about why digital stuff can be worth something. Um, but like digital things can be worth something. And uh, there are digital things that are, are worth stuff um, that are worth something. And I think like thinking about NFTs is just a way to capture that and represent that uh, in kind of a trustless manner because our government doesn't have the US dollar for you know video games or something like that. I think that's really cool. So if we start to think about NFTs as just this fundamental, it's just a primitive on the blockchain, which means it's just this, it's just this thing that developers use to make something happen. It's a means to an end. And we stop thinking about it as like these JPEGs. I think that will be a much more productive way to think about it. So for the time being, something that we're doing is we don't even call our games NFTs. We call them on-chain video games. It's just a way to represent video games on-chain and bring back ownership to the people. And so I think that's really important. It's figuring out how, how do we like rewrite the script on what an NFT is. Amazing, like how you said about the, how can we value these digital assets? So I like that. And that could be a highlight of this interview too. And so it was an interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I'm kind of sure that viewers watching that might have gained some knowledge with that and surely would have enjoyed this podcast as well. So if you have any questions, comments, queries, suggestions, jot them down in the comment section below. And if you're a gamer, don't forget to check out bash.gg. Uh, the links for that would be in the description below. And if you have any question, uh, questions about that, um, you can also write them in the comments. And uh, I'm pretty sure that Kyle would be happy to answer them all. Or you can just reach out um, bash.gg if you have any questions regarding them. Um, and I don't think so. You might have any questions if you check out the website first. So yeah, check it out. And if you have hunger for similar content, don't forget to check out the other videos on this channel. And if you like this video, give us a like. If you didn't, then mention what we can do to make it better. And until then... I will be back with another guest like Kyle in the, another episode of Money and Me. Until then, keep learning, keep growing, and keep developing um, or keep making the world a better place. I'll see you next time. My name is Hirsch, and this is Money and Me podcast. See you next time.